And that's not to say that you have to understand RFT in order to be good at working with people. Lots of people are very good at working with people and figuring out their motivations and how to help them do the things that are important to them without understanding any of the RFT underpinnings of what might be going on. But when it's, when it's not working, right, that's when you need those tools. All right, welcome back to Act Root to Root. My name is Marcel Tassar, and I'm working to understand as much as I can about the roots of the contextual behavioral sciences, ACT and FAP, and compassion-focused therapy, clinical behavior analysis, really. I think a lot of it boils down to and, uh, and so I'm really excited to share the space with uh, Siri Ming today. Thanks for joining me, Siri. Thanks, Marcel. Yeah, Siri's a, a, a BCBAD who does um, a bunch. Yeah, you're working and you're, you're writing an RFT. Your, your PhD is an RFT. Um, and um, really working on expanding this RFT work to the BCBA community. Mm-hmm. Um, just started a, a new project with... Evelyn Gould to uh, it's a self care practice for mostly BCBAs. Yeah. That one is me, Evelyn Gould, Julia Fiebig, and Rebecca Watson. Okay, um, constellations. So, yeah, I will. I'll put a link to that below. And um, you are, you know, you you've got your own stuff going on, which is awesome. I really value that and inspired by that because I, I too find that I want to have my independence and, and create my own my own kind of path. And uh, Mm -hmm. so I'm excited to to chop it up with you here. Thanks so much. Where schedules of reinforcement are thin, ACT is is helpful. What does that mean? Thin schedules of reinforcement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so in behavior analytic terms, we we talk about schedules of reinforcement as being kind of the Again, this comes back to this probabilistic view, right? Behavior is maintained not just when reinforcement occurs after every single instance of the behavior, right? Behavior is maintained over time by under varying intermittent deliveries mm-hmm. of reinforcement, right? So once it's established, then maybe, I mean, gambling is, of course, your perfect and classic example of this, right? Like, it's like you don't have to, you're going to keep pulling that lever Mm -hmm. on the slot machine um, for hundreds of of trials, potentially. Um, And I'm not a gambling researcher, so maybe it's thousands. I don't know. (laughs) It's a lot. Uh, Without any reinforcement contingent on that one response. But then reinforcement is delivered, and that's going to maintain responding for a while longer, right? And so when we talk about reinforcement schedules being thin, it means there's not a lot of immediate reinforcement in your environment. And Mm -hmm. so there's loads of contexts in real life in which you don't have a lot of immediate powerful reinforcement happening right um and i think your idea of of how how did you put it getting in the putting yourself in the way of pleasure i mean right like you're trying to increase the reinforcement schedules Mm. there right you're trying to bring more reinforcement to bear on a variety of behaviors. Um, When we look at, uh, I mean, ACT, but I think just broadly the idea of psychological flexibility as being the goal of ACT, um, being helpful under conditions of not very much immediate reinforcement or even punishment, Mm -hmm. right? Like there's lots of times that there are things that are really important to do that are immediately punishing, right? 
um, whether that's big punishers or small punishers or external or internal, right? Like anytime you're, anytime you put yourself in a space where something is challenging or uh, you have a lot of anxiety around it, right? Or like, like we talked at the beginning, like mm -hmm. coming on to, and talking about act stuff, right? Like yeah. that, that brings up a lot of very aversive stuff for me. Um, and so that's really the point of trying to promote and, and teach psychological flexibility is that when your immediate environment is not very reinforcing mm -hmm. or is actively punishing, bringing values into the mix, right, which is a part of psychological flexibility, bringing values into the mix immediately transforms the function of that environment to be mm -hmm. more reinforcing right mm -hmm. where it's kind of this this magical languaging thing that happens right as soon as i say well i as soon as i shift from i'm going on this podcast and i'm not an act person and i'm going to be terrible and this is going to be <laughs> awful <laughs> to I'm going on this podcast and it's really important to me to both challenge myself to be better at talking about this stuff and to help yes. other people understand it. Mm -hmm. Now this context has changed, right? In terms of its function, nothing topographically has changed, mm -hmm. but the function has changed. Yeah. And that's really, you know, that's really the, beautiful thing about act and understanding how this stuff operates on a languaging level is that you can you can see that happen so quickly for people mm -hmm. not yeah. all the time right but yeah but yeah. yeah and so so how would you describe that from um in rft jargon so in rft well let's okay the, the well, values let, component the values component right so when we look at kind of the RFT jargony piece of psychological flexibility, there's a bunch of stuff happening and there's lots of ways to unpack this. There's lots of ways you can I wish that stuff was one of the jargony the different... words in. Yeah, wouldn't that be <laughs> There, there's lots of stuff here. <laughs> um, and there's lots of ways you can categorize these. It's, it's, it's a very complex skill set, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and in behavior analysis, we talk a lot about complex composite skill sets being made up of component skill sets, right? Okay. That kind of interact and build on one another. Mm -hmm. And so we can, we can kind of chunk those component skill sets in a lot of different ways. But the way that Evie and Julie and I have kind of landed on as being the way we're going to talk about it for at least uh, from an RFT perspective is looking that psychological flexibility starts on a, this, this, we can't even talk about this linearly, right? This is where the Cantor thing comes in. It's like, this is all kind of happening at once. It's not yeah. a stepwise process, right? Yeah. But we're hierarchically framing. So we're categorizing something as being a part of me, right? I'm hierarchically framing my behavior. I'm hierarchically reclaiming framing my values, right? The things that are important to me in relation to the dialectic eye. So I'm saying that these things are a part of who I am. They're not the entirety of who I am, but they are a part of who I am. Okay. Right? I'm also deriving rules related to valuing. Okay. And values we can see from an RFT rule govern jargony perspective is motivative augmentals, right? They change the value of potential reinforcers and other consequences for following particular rules. Okay. And then augmental, right. can you say more about that word? Yeah. So a motivative augmental, right? Acts to augment <laughs> other rules. Okay. Right. So it changes, so let's back up a little bit, right? So if we look at a rule very basically as being a 
and in, let's get simple and just say it's it's sort of an instruction mm -hmm. that I've given myself or somebody else has given me and I don't have to necessarily have contact with the direct contingencies of following or not following that rule because I have fairly intact language and a history of following rules, I can, I can follow that rule, right? Um, and part of rules is the consequence that comes from following that rule, right? If you look both ways before you cross the street, you're less likely to get hit by a car, mm -hmm. right? If I come on a podcast about ACT, I will be terrible and I won't be able to say anything of value to anybody, <laughs> right? Those are both rules, mm -hmm. right? Those are both rules that either somebody has told me or somebody or that I've generated for myself out of all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so motivative augmentals come into the picture and change the value of those consequences, right? So coming back to the going on the act podcast thing, when I, when I bring my values into that rule, now those consequences change. There are different consequences. There are better consequences potentially okay. of doing this. Um, I often talk to people about kind of tie on a, on a much more concrete level with respect to project management and time management mm -hmm. um, is really getting clear about your values and tying them to the specific things you have to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis or within this project. And this is where the mindful action plan comes into play and all of that kind of stuff, right? When we kind of state what it is that I care about as the foundation for why I'm doing what I'm doing, mm -hmm things feel different, right? I could be, you know, I might have a bunch of very boring admin tasks, which I always do <laughs> on my, on my to-do list. Mm -hmm. And I might think to myself, geez, these are so boring and repetitive and I hate them. And uh, why I wish that I could not have to do them and all these other things, right? And they could feel terrible and I'd just begrudgingly get them all done. Um, but if I tie those tasks explicitly, like I color code my to-dos based on my values. Hmm. If I tie those tasks to my value of working independently, being able to make decisions autonomously, being able to be flexible in how and when I work so that I can better integrate those worky things into my all the other domains of my life. Yeah. Well, now those feel different, right? Now I'm doing those because they help me achieve the kind of work-life integration that I want to have. I hate to say it, but you sound like an act person. <laughs> Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those are motivative augmentals. Okay. Right? Those statements of my values as tied to the rules about what I have to be doing today. Okay. So I'm accessing that. I'm accessing yeah. that through language. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Hierarchically framing right so if these values are a part of me mm -hmm. right and these values are related to rules that i have about what i have to be doing now even though there's very little other reinforcement for doing those tasks at least immediate reinforcement for doing those tasks right now I have reinforcement available to me through my own languaging, right? Okay. The function of those tasks has changed. It becomes intrinsically reinforcing to, I mean, that's part of our definition of valuing, right? It's, these are intrinsically reinforcing patterns of behavior now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So that's the motivated, motivative augmental piece right? It, it transforms the function of stimuli in this context. And then that allows me to either persist in this behavior, right? 
um, to do those admin tasks because I know there are many reasons why they need to be done and they are a part of how I do my work um, or to change it, right? If I have something on my to-do this to-do list that I'm like, there is no purpose on earth for me to be doing this, except that somebody else told me I needed to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, then maybe I'm going to change that behavior. Right. Maybe on in a task kind of context, maybe I'm going to delegate that behavior to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Right. In a, in a more life context, maybe I'm just going to stop that. Right. If this serves no purpose then why am i doing it this mm -hmm. way what function are, are the different colors serving for you ah so those are essentially contextual cues that, that specify a specific a particular relation between my value so my values i'm looking over here because they're actually like right there behind me my values <laughs> are there <laughs> they're right there they're out visible functioning as discriminative stimuli and contextual cues for me right and one says i value independence and autonomy and how i work mm -hmm. and the flexibility to work when and how i want to in supporting myself and my kid and mm -hmm. then so that's pink and then right next to it is in pink sticky notes <laughs> admin tasks and yeah. billing and website maintenance and documentation and all of those kinds of things and so like i have green ones that are about you know dissemination and contributing to shared knowledge and blue ones about kind wow. of teaching and growing a healthy next generation of behavior analysts. And so I really try to, it, it just makes it all, it makes those value statements so much more salient in tying them to the things that I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, right? They're not just something I have to remember. Mm-hmm. And do you find yourself seeing those colors randomly and thinking about your values? Um, well, I do now. I Every so often I run out of that color of sticky note and I have to change it up oh, so, right. <laughs> so that it's not rigid. It's not rigid, yeah, Marcel. Yeah. It doesn't have okay, to be okay. fixed. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. But I do, but I, I mean, I do a lot of things that way. I have this, I have this little time tracker device. Yeah. It's called Timular. And it, on each side of it, it has different colors tied to the different activities that I'm trying to track oh. what I'm doing. And okay. then it's like, gives me a little behavior analysis very into graphical yeah, displays yeah. of data. So it, it gives me a nice color coded chart. Of so you where move I spent the device around when you're doing something. Yeah, yeah. So like it's it it you just kind of set it and whatever is on top uh -huh. is the category of things that you're tracking. And you it's wrote very you cool. you write on there. And That's you write on there. Yeah. Okay. It comes it comes with like a little pen and it wow. comes with other stickers, but I just color coded it with my own stickers. Huh, very cool. So I that's really, a very I, that's a I, very I, geeky behavior analytic thing it, for me to be doing. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate <laughs> your sharing your your trade. Your you know, this is who you are. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. The the um um and and that time that that device helps you kind of see where you're spending your time and what you want to what you want to tweak it, i mean it does yeah it it helps it helps on in in two ways much like kind of just color coding your values and having your value statements there mm -hmm. right because it's physical you have to actually choose what you're going to work on right mm. now right so that it it introduces choice points into yeah. your day uh -huh. and if you switch what you're doing then you have to either put it back if it's something that you're not tracking right like if oh like i'm gonna go on facebook now i have to put my tracker back <laughs> right i only track stuff that i want to do more of mm -hmm. um so i have to put it back if i'm gonna go on facebook yeah um or if i'm just gonna switch gears then i have to switch it so you don't have Aside for wasting time on Facebook or YouTube, no, 
I don't, I don't want to track that because I don't want that to get, I don't want to pay attention to that. That's so be- behavior analytic of you. I know. <laughs> what would be, what do you, what would be dangerous about that for you? Or not dangerous, um, but like not helpful, let's say. It would just not be helpful, right? Because it's what I'm, what I'm interested in is growing the time that I'm spending on meaningful values directed activities, mm-hmm. right? And I would rather focus on expanding that time than trying to reduce something else, right? If you pay it, it, it's, you know, it is very much this idea of just if you, if you focus on growing and expanding repertoires, then the other stuff takes care of itself, okay. right? Yeah. I mean, obviously not all circumstances, but for this sort of stuff, mm-hmm. that's what I find for myself. Okay. Other thing I wanted to talk about was this um, idea of pliance and psychological flexibility mm. that I sent mm-hmm. you about. That was kind of a, in a sentence that really jumped out to me in, in your guys' chapter. So before I do that, could you tell me what is pliance? So when... When we talk about rules from an RFT perspective, and um, there's there's certainly valid debate about whether these are real categories of rules, or these are probably better conceptualized as, again, more mid-level terms on, on things, but mm-hmm. we can really look at clients, tra- tracking, and then augmenting. And we talked about augmenting as being this additional rule that changes the function of another rule okay right and so those other rules are appliance and tracking and so at the at the simplest level we can think about appliance as following a rule because society or another person says you need to do this right? Mm-hmm. For social approval, to avoid social disapproval. Um, these are rules that are necessary for the smooth functioning of society. If everybody decided that, oh, I don't really need to stop at a red light, that <laughs> I'm going to be creative <laughs> in my driving behavior, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> that would be really bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need to follow the rules of the road because that's what everybody has agreed to do. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, and so there, and with little kids, like you, whenever you feel yourself just saying to your kid, when they ask you, well, why? And you say, because I said so you're teaching them pliance. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's important. It, it is actually important to follow rules yeah. because they are the social expectation of what needs to happen right now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's not that pliance is bad, it's just that pliance has a particular function. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then tracking is following a rule because of something other than just a social expectation, that there's an actual environmental consequence for following this rule. Okay. Okay. Like, some, and, like a brick flying at my head. I should move my head. Yes. <laughs> If I told you, if you see bricks coming at your head, you should move or else you will get hit and pass out. Mm -hmm. Um, And in the future, having never seen a brick before coming flying at you, you follow that rule, then yes, that could be conceptualized as as tracking, right? Um, Of course, in that particular example, there are other reasons why you might reflexively move out of the way of a brick. I probably stopped you short from giving a a good example of tracking. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So if somebody tells you that, um, let me think here. I feel like my students have always come up with better examples on the fly than, than I ever do. So if somebody tells you that, you know, you should get 10,000 steps a day in and that's Mm -hmm. you know that's the thing you need to do because I said I said that's you know that's what you need to do right it's because that's important 
right? Maybe teaching your kids, eat your vegetables because it's important <laughs> to, to be healthy, right? Being healthy isn't really a consequence in the sense of like, we can't contact that contingency, okay. right? I can't really, I mean, when I eat my vegetables, I'm not suddenly healthy, right? As a, as a change in my environment, Okay. right? Yeah. But if I say, you know, get in your 10,000 steps a day and monitor how you feel at the end of the day, how well you sleep at the end of the day. Uh, I'm telling you that if you get in all your steps, you're going to sleep better. You're going to wake up more refreshed. You're going to start feeling more cardiovascular capacity, (laughs) whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm telling you, these are the things in your environment that should be the outcome of this not just some vague, you know, we've agreed that this is the thing everybody should do, okay. um, you know, or you eat your vegetables to your stuff so that you can be healthy uh, and you follow that rule. That would be an example of tracking. You're doing it because of some stated environmental contingencies, and then you can track whether or not those are occurring, mm. right? And you can change on that basis. There's always an interplay between following a rule and coming under the contingencies of following that rule, right? You end up being shaped by those actual environmental consequences too. So it's never this pure one thing or another, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so appliance is kind of doing things because you're supposed to. And tracking is doing things because it works, right? Doing things because this works for you in this particular environment, right? And you notice, and you notice that, Mm -hmm. right? The difference between just somebody telling you to take um, take an umbrella today for no particular reason other than I said, you should always be prepared. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Always be prepared. And somebody saying, you know, take an umbrella because I saw on the weather that there's a 100% chance of rain this afternoon, right? Mm -hmm. You're tying it to actual environmental contingencies rather than some vague notion of always be prepared. Okay. 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 So when it comes to psychological flexibility, right, a lot of rigid behavior results from clients, right? where I'm just doing things because I'm told to do them. Mm -hmm. I, sometimes I might tell myself these things, right. But there's no real environmental outcome Mm -hmm. of doing them that Mm -hmm. is immediately influencing my behavior. And so with psychological flexibility, we're really trying to kind of reduce the influence of clients by bringing in valuing, right by bringing in other kinds of rules that help you to notice what's actually happening in your context when you either follow this rule or don't follow this rule. Okay. So back to the traffic or driving example. Yeah, yeah. If we are more psychologically flexible, we're less likely to drive safe. (laughs) <laughs> no. <laughs> well, let me let me rephrase that so like so um one of the way that i am what i'm referring to is a sentence in in your chapter that said something to the effect yes. of clients going down when psychological flexibility goes up sure and, and i guess i'm struggling with that idea so let me see how i could phrase it differently let's let's look at this example of stopping at a red light all right Mm -hmm. under most circumstances there are loads and loads of other reasons why you in the immediate environment that might be telling you to also stop at this red light like there's cross traffic right Mm -hmm. and so it kind of i'm I'm teaching my kid to drive right now. So I'm really trying to point out the environmental consequences of not following the rules of the road. Right. So there's, so there's definitely many 
real immediate consequential reasons to follow those rules besides just that's what's in your driving handbook, mm -hmm. right? So that might not have been the best example necessarily of clients, um, except if you are driving somewhere at night in the middle of nowhere, I'm, I actually had this experience once. I was coming out of an airport, I think in Winnipeg, a long time ago, and it's like way out in the middle of nowhere, and there is this traffic light. And, and I stopped, of course, mm -hmm. right? But this traffic light was red for like minutes, and there was like nobody yeah, right. around for miles and miles. Sounds like a, maybe a joke, someone put it there. <laughs> like, what the hell is going on with this traffic light? Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like we have some of those lights around us too that just sit there, stop mm -hmm. for a really long time. There's nobody coming. Um, and so from appliance perspective, you would just sit there at that red light because you know you're supposed to stay stopped at a red light, Yeah. right? Um, and that's fine. There's, there's no harm in doing that, right? And there is potential harm of not following those kinds of rules. Um, but if you were looking at it from following the rule as a tracking, right? Or I stop at red lights because it is safe and it allows other drivers to have their turn and it allows me to not get hit by other drivers. Well, now I can see that that rule doesn't apply in this circumstance, mm -hmm. right? And so that's really what we're trying to get at with psychological flexibility is noticing when rules do and do not apply in particular contexts, okay. right? And so noticing the actual environmental reasons, the variables that provide the consequential contingencies for following a rule helps you be more flexible. Okay. Does yeah, that, does yeah, that make more yeah, sense? Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. And I, I, I think that, you know, where I, I was a little bit stuck on is just the idea that, like, I, I think that I was hearing some value stuff around clients kind of being bad, you know? Well, and that, I mean, I think that, I think that shows up in a lot of how we talk about clients, right? Yeah. Um, in, in general, this idea, and I think it's a cultural thing. Yeah. I think there are certain yeah. cultures where clients is actually highly valued, mm -hmm. right? That it is very important to be following social conventions and adhering to the rules that mm -hmm. have been kind of set out as being this is this is what you do because this is how we do it, right? Um, and so there are a lot of cultures that value that very highly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you hear me talk, you probably hear the influence a lot of my own very Western cultural hippie burner upbringing <laughs> that says like, I don't do anything just because you told me to. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Um, and so there, there is definitely some cultural evaluation around that. And of course on the, you know, from just a pure theory, it's not even really theory, but from a, from a pure theoretical perspective, like there's, it's not that one is better than another right they each have particular functions if we didn't have clients we would not have a functioning society yeah right um it's critical to lots of things that we don't necessarily think about um right and if we don't have tracking we would be really unable to change our behavior in response to change in context that change how rules actually operate mm -hmm. So yeah, there's you. You may hear that from me. You probably hear that lots of people who talk about this stuff in the act. I mean, act worlders in general are not very pliant. I guess <laughs> right? they don't, they don't yeah, no, value I, that as much. I think, um, but that doesn't mean it's bad. Okay. Right. I, I appreciate you acknowledging that, and I think that that's you know kind of what I was I was gathering too. You know, yeah. just the cultural components, and I. Mm, 
So, okay. So we're talking about this textbook. When is, when is your textbook coming out? Oh, not for another year. We're like halfway through, right? So what's, what's the title of this awesome book coming out next year? (laughs) Yeah. So, um, it is understanding and applying RFT complex language as the foundation of our work as behavior analysts. And, uh, and our pet name for it is frame by frame, because we think of these as the building blocks uh, of all of our work. But I also want to give a shout out and a, and a plug for some other work that I'm doing yeah, with Vicky and Julia and another colleague of ours, Becky Watson, because, um, right, we just launched in January, but we have developed an online community of practice and workshop space for behavior analysts that we have started doing yeah, uh, self-care workshops, self-care workshops. And then I'm doing an RFT and early intervention coaching group. Uh, so we're, we're very, very excited about that. Nice. Nice. So I'll, yeah, I'll put a link below for yeah, that. Please and, do. Uh, and then Evie and, and I are doing, sorry. No, go ahead, and then go ahead. Evie and I, Evie and I are doing a workshop for ABAC Live on psychological flexibility, and that's uh, the end of April. Okay. Yeah. I think April twenty third. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll be up and running by then. And uh, you also do um, work with BCBAs around licensure, right? Uh, yeah. Certification. Certification. So um, a lot. So. I do supervision towards certification, um, although that has become less and less a focus of my practice. Um, I I, I do that primarily, really almost exclusively with people who are in other countries um, who don't have access to supervision. Um, So I, I do that a little bit, and then my practice with BCBAs has really shifted more over the last few years towards coaching either around RFT and early intervention or more around just um, larger practice issues, complex case consultation kinds of things, or working with people who are, I guess, at a, at a choice point in what they're doing, trying mm-hmm. to figure out kind of what's next in, in their career and, and their practice and, and wanting some support and clarifying values and really moving forward from that standpoint cool cool yeah um well i'll put all your your data below and uh i'm excited to bust out some highlighters later today (laughs) maybe i'll get some scented ones and help you know (laughs) there you go transform those functions (laughs) (laughs) um and uh, I also just want to mention, you know, we um, got a group going, um, doing some groups with with Luke Vandenberg, some FAP training groups, which are nice. in part to learn uh, FAP, in part to work on the experiential part of, of this work, and um, and then also for folks who are interested in, in, in running groups, that's, but that's not necessary, necessary, you know, necessary objective for, for joining, so you can hit me up if you're interested. And uh, thanks for chopping up with me. Sorry. But I'm getting stronger. They take a piece of me. But I'm getting stronger. They take a piece of me. But I'm getting stronger. They take a piece of me. But I'm getting stronger.